Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. Um, I'm so glad to have you joining us for our webinar. Today, this webinar is sponsored by the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands, Utah State University Forestry Extension, and our special um, sponsor today as well, the Tree Fund. I'd like to extend um, a warm welcome to our speaker, Dr. Ed Gilman. Um, I'm going to have uh, Bo introduce Dr. Gilman today, but before I sign off, I'd just like to ask you to mark your calendar for next month's webinar on June 14th. Um, Kevin Potter from North Carolina State University and Sandy Wilmot from the Department of Forestry, Fire, and Recreation in Vermont will be joining us. So that does it for me. I'm going to hand it over to Bo now. Thanks, Megan. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Good afternoon. My name is Bo Broadbeck. I work with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System, and I am a trustee with the Tree Fund. And before I introduce Dr. Gilman, I'd like to spend a few minutes and introduce you all to the Tree Fund, a little bit about who the Tree Fund is, what the Tree Fund does, and how you can support the Tree Fund. The Tree Fund supports and funds scientific discovery and the dissemination of new knowledge in the fields of arboriculture and urban forestry. They do this through a variety of grants that they have available internationally to researchers from all over the world, as well as scholarships for aspiring tree care professionals. Um, they also support education, uh, particularly in children's education. Um, to date, since 2002, the Tree Fund has funded about $2.8 million in research their research priorities are in root and soil management, planting and establishment, plant health care, risk assessment and worker safety, and urban forestry. The Tree Fund funds applied research, so trying to take that research from the lab and delivering it to y'all in the field to help you ensure that you have healthier, healthier, safer, and more resilient urban forests. They have a few different research grant programs ranging from $10,000 up to $100,000. The smaller grant funds are seed monies for innovative research, new techniques, and trying to introduce those to the field of arboriculture. Their larger grants are once again applied researcher, ensuring that you in the field uh, have the latest techniques and the newest information for caring for trees. They also have undergraduate scholarship programs for the next generation of arborists and urban foresters, ranging from two to three thousand um, dollars. I've had a chance to meet some of these students, a fantastic group of students that are coming through and will be the future of arboriculture. Uh, finally, they have education grants. These are largely aimed at children, uh, usually five thousand dollar grants to help introduce our young minds to the field of arboriculture, urban forestry, our green infrastructure and the values that they contribute uh, to our communities. Um, the Tree Fund's revenue sources come from a variety of places, beginning from with individual donations from people like you and I. You can contribute to the Tree Fund through supporting uh, riders who are cycling in the Tour de Trees event, which occurs every year in association with the International Society of Arboriculture Annual Conference, uh, to some of their after hours events, as well as endowment earnings, corporate partnerships, community engagement events, and legacy giving through their Heritage Oak uh, Society. I encourage you at some point to take a look at the Tree Fund. Go to treefund.org. You can look at the previous research that's been funded, previous researchers like Dr. Ed Gilman, who has been funded, uh, I'm fairly certain, multiple times for a lot of the studies that many of us have benefited from over the years. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Gilman. But first, let me introduce Dr. Gilman. Uh, Dr. Gilman received his PhD from Rutgers and has been on the faculty since 1984 as a professor in environmental horticulture department at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Ed wrote an illustrated guide to pruning, which in 2012 was printed in its third edition. He received the Author Citation Award in 1999 the Educators Award in 2003, and the Research Award in 2007 from the International Society of Arboriculture. He has published more than 120 scientific peer-reviewed journal articles on roots, planting, and pruning trees in his 35 years in academia and industry. Ed, thank you very much for being here today. And at this point, I will turn over the, floor to, the virtual floor to you. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Apologize for the uh, glitch 
there, but you know, things happen electronically. Thank God it came back. So we're just going to jump right into this uh, pruning, which you know, I've gone I've gone to so many of the places that, that I saw folks log in from, from Saskatoon to Regina to Netherlands to all over the U.S. It's, it's really, uh, well, welcome back. It's, re it's really great to see everybody here. And, and what I've learned by traveling is, is that, uh, and just watching how trees are managed is pruning, whether it's in different parts of Florida or, or Germany or, or, or up where, where uh, middle part of the country or out west or, or in Asia, it's culture based. It's it doesn't seem to be science or experience based, and it's certainly not standards based. For that's been my experience, and it's it's a frustration by by many people. And it's it's a it's a I think historically just based on the way people prune trees in their particular area. So we're going to focus today on on. Um, Writing specifications, because it's a great form of, of communicating uh, what needs to be done to trees. And, and you'll, you'll, you'll see by examples on older, medium age, and younger trees that uh, we're, we're going to show you before, after, and even five, ten years later what trees look like. But we're going to focus on, on how to communicate that through writing and uh, using the ANSI A300, which is the American National Standards Institute um, standards, which are being uh, rewritten as we speak now. It should be out later 2016 or so. Let's start out with this because it's in so many parts of the world misunderstood. The best way to thin the crown is to structurally prune it. You think about that, it makes life so much simpler. And, and whenever a tree is structurally pruned, we're going to show you today, it becomes thinner. So there's just some food for thought. The, the, other, the other starting point is, is to look at this research-based image on the left and compare it to this um, more hypothetical image on the right. We have, we're pretty convinced through research that uh, Dr. Brian Kane, Tom Smiley, myself, and maybe one or two other folks have done with various wind machines and, and ways of, of putting trees through, through wind events before and after pruning. That if you look in that left image, if, if you take these dashed lines off these branches indicated by dashed lines, you'll reduce the mechanical stress on the trunk, which is the, the major part of the lower lower tree. And if you take off the dotted lines, the branches with dotted lines, you'll see throughout here, we've and others have measured less mechanical stress on the major branches that I'm pointing out here. There's four or five on that tree. So we take this research-based information here, and we unfortunately in 2016 have to extrapolate that up to larger trees. But there's a, a number of, of folks that are pretty convinced that, that this research translates up to at least a, a modicum of, of, um, uh, of applying to, to these larger trees. And you can see if we take these branches off with dotted lines over on this larger trees, that those five branches with arrows, the mechanical stress on those is going to be reduced. So uh, that, that, that's a, a starting point for us. So I, I thought I, we'd show you these videos of an unpruned tree with about 80 to 90 mile an hour wind. So, so let's show you that. And you watch how much that tree moved compared to a tree here. We've reduced it. So we've essentially done this to it or this. So now we're going to watch and see how the branch that we're going to leave moves when we, when we reduce it. And that's, uh, that's this one here. And so you can see how little, I'll go back and play that again, but uh, you can see how little that main trunk especially moves. Watch how little the trunk moves in the middle. All right, notice how little that moves. It's so weird not being able to see you guys react to that. Uh, <laughs> it's unfortunate, but that's the first time I did this, so we'll see how this goes. So with that in mind, that background in mind, structurally pruning is the best way to thin a tree. 
and that research-based video that, that I just showed you there. Typical management worldwide, uh, whether it's uh, North America, uh, Canada, US, Asia, Europe, a lot of trees are pruned in this manner through the center, and we end up with a candelabra shape. Or no management at all, we end up sort of with a bush form, real short trunk and lots of co-dominant stems. We think the better management we're gonna to teach today is this lower route where we're going to develop a more of a dominant leader. And you can see we purposely drew that um, not straight. It's not important that it's straight. What's important is that the branches are smaller than the trunk. And that really is the key. So here we prune the same species. This is in California in Visalia, Central Valley, California, dry climate. Same species, these are pistachio chinets on the left, pruned to a dominant leader, and on the right, we did no pruning. We simply let the nursery form develop and did not correct. And let's bring us through the management of these trees as they get older. First, the codominant stem trees are very difficult to manage. As we start to raise the crown, and if you look carefully, you can see some old pruning one here. But then up here, there's three or four brand new pruning ones. And you know what's gonna happen in the next few weeks is these are gonna sprout and then who hates trees? Well, this, this particular bank probably is not too key, keen on trees now because they can't see the sign. There's also a lot of wood in the way. Look at all the, the branchiness in here. And so it's, it, it makes it more difficult for people to see and experience the building in behind compared to the other side of town where we had pruned over a number of years these same species of trees to a dominant leader. Now the crews are able to raise the crown, creating clearance for passage and visual views of the businesses. And it just makes so much more sense as you look down that those five or six trees along that street for the, those businesses are going to enjoy the trees now because they're going to welcome people in. People can see their businesses. They can, they can park their cars. They can ingress, egress, get to the shops without uh, any problem. So the dominant leader makes it not only stronger mechanically, but also makes more sense from a, from a downtown especially perspective where people and vehicles are going to be close to the tree. So th this is a good, a, a good starting point. If we look at the ANSI, the American ANSI uh, National Standards Institute, part one, which is the pruning standard. You're going to notice when it comes out the latter part of this year that there's a new item called system. In addition to objective, method, cut location, cut type, and cut number and diameter, this new parameter called system has been introduced. Now, since it's not active today, because this is the, the developing standard, we're going to put a line through that for today. But, but know that that's coming. What we're going to show you today is not pilarding, not espalier. We're going to show you the natural system, which is how 98, 99% of the trees are typically pruned to, to become the large uh, shade tree or, uh, or small uh, crab apple or whatever type of tree you're, you're pruning, pruning to. But it's a natural. You're not controlling size or shape uh, as much as structurally pruning. And then the, the, the um, if, if we then, now we're down to five items because we've just eliminated um, system. And, and so whether you're talking to the crew or to your customers, th these are the five things that we think are very easy to communicate. Most of them have been in the standard from, um, from the late 80s, early 90s. Where it's just reorganized a little bit. So let's say, for example, our main, main objectives are typically reduce risk, improve clearance, and make the tree look better. And if we go down to method, methods of pruning as it's been presented up until today have been, for example, reduce the crown, raise the crown, thin the crown. Well, if we hook those up and look at the words under objective and under method, they're pretty similar. Reduce risk sounds a lot like reduce. Clearance under the crown sounds a lot like raise. Make the tree look better. Well, that, that could be thinning. And so the committee that's working on this uh, decided to remove methods from the standards. They're now in the annex, and these are in the proposed standards. Uh, you'll have a chance to review these, by the way, uh, shortly uh, for the second time. So now we're down to, to four items, objective, location, 
type of cut and number of cuts. And that's, that's the ANSI part one approach. So that's what we're going to focus on here in the next 30 minutes or so is identifying these four items as we go through the trees. Great way to communicate to your crew, your customers, uh, and if you're writing specs for a municipality or if you're the municipality writing specs, these are the items that, that can be addressed, should be addressed. Some definitions, uh, of course, the leader is that item that grows up from the trunk and makes its way up toward the top of the crown. A whorl or cluster of branches would be a group together. It says my internet connection is unstable. I hope I don't lose my internet connection. I think we Scaff can still hear you. Okay. Okay. All right, good deal. Scaffold or main limb is those that are among the largest on the on the tree. Reduction cut, real important concept here. That is a cut that at a union removes the largest and retains the smallest. Very simple concept. Removal cut, on the other hand, is exactly the opposite. It removes the smaller of the two items at a union. Very important to distinguish between these two. Probably the most important distinguishing feature to put in a specification is what type of pruning cuts do you want, reduction or removal cuts. I'm going to show you the result is very, very different. Interior branches are predictable. Typically, the non-pruning zone, the part of the tree where we don't touch, typically under most scenarios, the periphery or the exterior branches, that is your pruning zone. That's where we do most of our work. Aspect ratio is a concept that's been around about 40 years, but we've brought it back because we found it and others have found it to be just at the heart of tree structure. Here's how it goes, very simple. The smaller the branch is compared to the trunk, in other words, the diameter at A, when it's very small compared to the diameter at B, that union is very strong. When the A and B are about the same size or approach the same size, that union is not as strong as when the aspect ratio is small. So that's a really important concept. So this would be stronger union than, than this because these are nearly codominant stems. So we can see I've circled one codominant stem here. Let's say they're both 14 inches in diameter. Then you've got, um, you've got a weak situation. There's also codominant branches uh, out here I've marked in white. If you look at a couple of places there. Now, conceptually, let's go back to high school physics, right? One of your favorite subjects, I'm sure. But very simply, if we had a defect in that part of the plant that I'm circling, and let's say we had two branches in question here. We had a thousand pound branch out here and a thousand pound branch in here. Let's compare the reduction in, in leverage and, and how effective pruning each of those two branches are on the mechanical stress back at the trunk along that defect. So, for example, if we were to remove that, that blue branch with the blue cut right, right there, we were to remove that, it's 40 feet from the trunk. And so if we multiply 40 times the 1,000 pounds, we have 40,000 foot-pounds of torque or moment. Torque just like an engine in a car has has torque, same exact concept. So that's 40,000. Now, if we were to remove this branch instead at the red cut line, making a removal cut, since we're only 25 feet out, we've only got a 25 times 1,000 pounds or 25,000 pound feet of reduction in moment. So which one then is gonna give you the better mechanically strong tree? That's going to be this cut at the blue line uh, out here. And it's simply because it's farther out. There's a greater distance between any defect and where the pruning cut was made. So that, that should be pretty simple, straightforward uh, concept. That's why we call the periphery of the crown the pruning zone, not the interior, not the red cut that's on the interior. Those are the ones we want to leave on the tree. 
So here's a tree pretty nicely pruned, working pretty much the periphery almost exclusively. So those are reduction cuts, reduction cuts only. I don't see any removal cuts looking around that tree. They're all reduction cuts. So let's look at our common objectives that we're going to reduce risk. We're going to provide clearance, improve aesthetics, and I added one, reduce size. Let's look at some examples of each of these. Here we're in Saskatoon Park in, uh, in downtown, I think it was Delta Park. We got three liters there by the arborist on the left, and after pruning, you say we're down to one liter on, on the right. This is structural pruning. The crown becomes thinner, you can see that, with structural pruning. Here's a bigger plant where, where the, the, the structural pruning now is going to address that circled item in yellow. That's the co-dominant stem. Those are probably each about 20 inches in diameter, both stems. If you look carefully, you can see the arborist up here. So you have some sense for our approach. We want to reduce mechanical stress toward the bottom where these two combine or they meet. And so here you can see the arborist is made right at the tip of my arrow there. Hopefully you can see that. It's about a three and a half inch reduction cut to reduce the stress, mechanical stress, here at the base of that stem, which, which improves the structure of that tree with just one pruning cut. All right, clearance, when we're gonna make pruning cuts like this, now this is pretty tough on the tree in drought. You know, lots of us here have been uh, subjected to drought, especially the Western United States, and trees that are under drought stress, when we make especially large pruning cuts on the trunk like this, much less preferred than if we have the opportunity to reduce that branch instead of remove it. We don't have time to get into how this works, but the, the third edition of Illustrated Guide to Pruning has got a great discussion of drought and how this might uh, work um, when we prune a tree, how, how those trees can be more susceptible to, to infection and, and decay. But we like to make smaller cuts than this, nine inch cut, which we had to make to clear the, the, the tree. So to do that, we'd want to go farther out on this, uh, on this branch instead of remove. If you don't want removal cuts like this and you're concerned about, here's a white pine over on the right and an oak on the left, probably another oak in the middle then uh, you got to specify that you don't want removal cuts on the trunk. That needs to be in your pruning specification. And yeah, we've got to get that specific if we're going to improve the quality of our contractors and improve the quality of the work that uh, we're asking for. I'm convinced that we don't get the pruning we want because we don't ask for it. Completely convinced about that. Maybe we don't know how to ask for it, and that's what I'm here to kind of give you enough to be dangerous uh, about anyway today. And then, so we just talked about improving structure, providing uh, clearance, and here reducing size, some of the major objectives here in an apple orchard where we're keeping the whole, whole canopy uh, short. A couple of substandard uh, pruning examples here is a before and an after. Now, the, in order to prevent this type of, of pruning, if you had have clearly specified in your right, written specifications that 80 to 90% of the pruning cuts shall be re reduction cuts, then this wouldn't have happened because these are all removal cuts. All the branches that were taken off this tree were, were smaller than the union they cut back to. By definition, those are removal cuts. So if in the specification it said no more than 10% of the cuts shall be removal cuts, you won't get pruning like this. So that's something to think about. I wanted to plant that seed today and let you think more about that. These are all removal cuts resulting in lion's tailing with not addressing the codominant stem circled there in the red at all. There's no... Uh, no remediation, no treatment of that uh, structural weak weakness in the tree. And here we are two years later, and you can see that gap that's opened up. In fact, many gaps have opened up in the crown since, because when you lion's tail with all removal cuts, which is what lion's tailing is, then the branches get longer and they start to droop. 
and um, gaps open up in the crown. So here's here's the approach then to to pruning trees of really of any age. What's your objective? Where are the cuts located in the tree? What pruning cut type are we going to use? Reduction, removal, and quite honestly, occasionally heading. And then how many cuts in the diameter? And that, that addresses, this last item addresses dosage or amount of pruning is what the standard calls it. So with that in mind, with, with those four things in mind, you should probably have those written down. Objective, cut location, cut type, cut number, and diameter. Here's a tree that's that's failed. I'm going to give you five more slides of this. There's Larry Costello standing or squatting at the bottom there. This is a large Quercus lobata, valley oak in California. And this tree's probably 90, 100 feet tall. And let's take a close up of this area of the tree. So I want you to specify what kind of work needs to be done to this tree. There's a close up. And right in the center there, I see compacted xylem that failed, and I see the pith exposed for about five or six feet. And whenever I see that, I know that was a codominant branch, right? Because codoms fail back to the pith typically, and you may or may not have inclusions. This one did not, not have any inclusions. It was all compacted xylem. And as this four-foot diameter branch failed, this is a big tree it broke these two branches here on the way down. So I'll show you a couple of other photos. There's the, sort of the upper right hand side of the tree and you can see the failure down here. And then there's the whole tree. So I usually give, when I do this live, I usually give folks about a minute and you chat with each other, but I'm not sure that's gonna work here in the webinar. So I'll just bring us kind of through here. So I look at this tree and I say, okay, the biggest branch failed. So where should I, it's in a park, there's lots of targets. Where should I focus my efforts on? Well, I think the answer is the largest branches. So uh, we'll get to that in a second. So the first decision might be, what are we going to do with these failed branches? Are we going to remove those, th this branch back to the trunk? Are we going to cut these off with heading cuts? right there where they failed, or are we going to do nothing at all? That's the decision you have to make as the professional. And, and then the second approach is to reduce those four branches. And the size of the arrow, or the thickness, I should say, is, is indicative of the amount or the dosage, if you will, that should be taken off each one. Notice the uh, center right, I've got the most taken off because the arrow is the thickest, and the other three we're going to take some off. So if we go back to our, kind of keep that tree in mind here in your mind, those four branches that we're going to reduce, and then the broken branches uh, right in there. So our objective is reduce risk of that tree failing more. We're going to work the periphery of the largest branches, and there's clearly four on the tree. We're going to make uh, reduction cuts primarily on those four, well, exclusively on those four. And we may make a removal or heading cut on those two broken branches. And we're gonna be in the, the four to five inch diameter reduction cut size. And we'll probably make one cut on each of those four largest branches. And then if you're inclined to make heading cuts to clean up those two tears, they're in the neighborhood of 12 to 14 inches in diameter. So that's the approach. You see, very methodical. It's very easy. Once you, probably the hardest part is, is setting your objective because you're almost always going to be working the largest diameter branches, no matter what size tree or age tree you're going to be working with. And you're typically going to be used reduction cuts, and then it's a matter of how many and what diameter. So the approach is pretty easy. All right, this is some pruning that Scott Baker in Seattle did on a large 100, 110 foot tall American elm tree. And what would you say was done here? Just take 10 seconds while I take my drink of water here. What, what do you think was done here? How do you describe it? Well, the way I would describe it is I would say there's many dozens of reduction cuts in the two to four inch diameter range. So that, that's very easy to communicate to an arborist. If you were to walk up to this tree and 
the arborist here you can see has gained access to the top of the tree with this crane and and the assignment was 60 to 70 reduction cuts in a two to four inch diameter size that's pretty clear it's it's pretty easy to count the number of cuts once they're on the ground and it's pretty easy to eyeball or even measure the diameter of the cuts Let's say we're going to specify a group of trees. This is in the Netherlands someplace on, on the way to the airport. And uh, the tree of choice there is uh, where there's many of the Quercus, um, um, yeah, the English oak, if you're in England, the Irish oak, if you're in Ireland, uh, Rober, yeah. So you can see maybe if you've got several hundred trees like this to prune, maybe you'd look at this tree and the 10th tree down, the 20th, and the 30th. So you take a, a cruise of sorts, a percentage sample or survey, if you will, and you would, you would go up into this tree by eyeball and say, okay, I'm going to need about six reduction cuts, three to four inches in size. Skip these nine trees, go to the 10th tree. I'm going to need eight reduction cuts, three or four inches in size. So you do this to, to as many trees as you need to, uh, every 10th, 20th tree or so, depending on what size survey you're going to do. Do a little mathematics, and then you have a specification for where to make the cuts, what type of cuts, and the number of cuts, and the size of cuts. Your objective here will be reduce risk. So let's practice writing. Uh, the objective uh, is in most cases going to be improved branch structure, I'm sorry, improved branch architecture by subordinating or removing all but one dominant stem. So the arborist is typically going to be working on the largest and or the defective limbs or branches on the tree. And that's a good phrase to put in pretty much every pruning specification. Improved branch architecture by subordinating or removing all but one dominant stem. You get into mature trees and it gets a little bit more complicated than that. This would be more for the younger and the medium aged. Uh, folks are doing this. This is uh, Brian Kemp's photograph from California. 6,000 trees or so are going to the Apple campus in Cupertino and uh, Brian and, and, and his crew are pruning pretty much every one of the trees going in. Uh, back at the nurseries two or three times over the course of several years to ensure that uh, the trees have leaders. Uh, these are Quercus lobatas again, California Valley Oak, that the trees have leaders going into the job site. So this pruning is, uh, is, is catching on slowly. There's people doing this uh, all over the world to different degrees. So here's an example. Here's pruning a planting. We're going to start a planting here in the upper left. So there's one pruning cut there. You can see I circled and then on the right is the tree two years later. You can see how much growth we pushed into that lead. We reduced this branch and that produced more growth in the, in the leader. So here we are five years later and there's the pruning cut there on the left. And then you can see the whole tree on the right. You can see just how much growth occurred. So this pruning works. You can track this for 5, 10. I've tracked some for over 20 years. We probably won't get that far into the seminar. But there we saw on the left before pruning and then after one pruning cut. So here this would be one pruning cut at planting, half inch in diameter on the stem that's competing with the leader. One cut made such a difference. This gets a little bit more complicated here where you're writing a specification for this youngster. And there's an acer. There's the defect. I circled a large aspect ratio branch, almost a co-dominant stem. And you see after pruning, we've got that one, I'll call it a super dominant leader, if you will. And everything's been pruned that's not the leader. That's up all in the business of the leader. So if you look very carefully, like up in here, there's a heading cut there. I made a heading cut there. There's a heading cut there where you don't have laterals to cut back to to make a reduction cut. You've got to make a heading cut on these young trees. I got no problem with that. We, these, in fact, I saw these trees yesterday. Uh, we pruned these probably eight years ago. The trees look fantastic. Here's a ginkgo tree. Describe what was done here. 
you know, it gets a little bit more complicated, but we're essentially working with the largest four or five aspect ratio branches. Those are the tree, the branches that were cut on this tree. Well, let's look at the left. There's a big aspect ratio branch. There's two here. There's one there. And there's probably another one in there someplace. But if you look on the right where all the printing cuts were made, you know, we reduced the big ones. We actually removed, there were two down here. You can see we removed that back, one of the back side. Big reduction on, on the biggest branches. So now we've got one lead. There's the tree a year later on the left. All the growth occurred in the, in the leader. And we pruned it again and it grew. So we got nice structure on that tree and just two prunings. It's working the biggest diameter branches using reduction cuts, specifying the number and the diameter. Let's see. 40. Oh, we're doing pretty well here. So this is a tree in Norway, and um, I asked the group, I was walking around town in Bergen and asked my host, Eric, over there. I said, where'd you guys uh, learn to do this pruning? And, you know, I'm, you can't make this stuff up. He said, we bought your pruning book, and we read it. I said, wow, you actually believed it, huh? So they went out, and they started to prune trees this way, and you can see their cuts. There's two removal cuts in yellow and seven or eight reduction cuts. So they've started the process of removing the, the low branches to, to provide the clearance over time. They made a re removal cut up here to completely take off the codominant stem, which is pretty cool. I didn't see the trees before they were pruned, so I don't have a before shot. This gets challenging. Here's a tree, and folks in California will recognize these, uh, the, these forms of trees. It seems like the culture in, um, in, in the West, California in particular, another place, I'm not picking on California guys, because I, I see this uh, when I first came to Florida in the late, mid to late 80s. We don't do this anymore, but you'll see a, a trunk seven to eight feet, which is about as tall as a person stands with their arms stretched up with a pruning shears in it. And then they're topped in the nursery and then all the branches grow out. Well, it's not catastrophic unless we do nothing, all right? So we're gonna do something. We're gonna make reduction, removal, and in some cases, heading cuts. You know, you could, that's, that's a heading cut. You know, that's a heading cut up there. That's probably a heading cut there, heading cut there. Unfortunately, I don't have a shot of this down the road, but that gives you some idea of, of the approach. This is in Eastern Pennsylvania at Longwood Gardens, a great group of arborists there I've been working with over the years. So there's three leads in the upper left. The, the two have been reduced. We, we picked one as the leader. There's a removal cut there, a couple of reduction cuts here. We even went up and reduced again. So one reduction, two reduction on the same branch. That's what we removed. Probably 35% of the buds removed. That's another way you can specify dosage is how many buds or what percentage of the foliage has been removed. I guess that's more of a classic way of expressing amount or dose. It's just very, very difficult to measure afterwards, and I can find almost no two people agree on the number. That's why I like size of cuts and number of cuts better. Of course, type of cuts are very important as well because you can go back and count that. It's a very countable system. That's what the tree looked like on the left. One year later, you can see a nice uh, lead. This is sugar maple, by the way, Acer, Saccharum. Second time we pruned the tree, this is 12 months after the first pruning. Then we took off less this time, smaller cuts. And there's the tree on the left. One year later, you can see a nice leader developing. We're kind of converting this big shrub into a something that looks more like a tree. The tree grew a couple of years, a couple of years later. So we started with that on the right, and we've got this after six years. So now we have a, a tree that's kind of a hybrid between the unpruned, open-grown mess, that's a shrub, and the woods-grown dominant leader, but, but not, not quite as, as dominant as you'd find in, in the woods, sort of a hybrid between the two scenarios. This is a bur oak. I'm, I'm trying to pick species that were kind of in the drier Midwest part and western part of the U.S. Um, this is up again in Saskatoon, but it could be anywhere. Kind of hard to see this, but there's an arborist in the upper left. He is on the leader, tied into the leader. 
And there's a close up on the right. So if you look carefully here, the arborist's right hand is on a stem we're going to be removing back to, to, to the trunk. There's a reduction cut up here. And uh, there's three reduction cuts uh, there showing up. You can see a reduction cut on the left. That must have been up in here. So that was the top of the tree kind of taken care of. But then we didn't like this big old thing coming here, so we simply removed it. And that cut was made down in here. You can't really see it. But now we've got a nice leader. You can see the reduction cut right there. You can't really see this, but you can imagine where it was there. And now this tree's off to a fantastic start. Here's what I found doing this for so long in different places, whether it's Italy or Hong Kong or, or, or Miami, where I was last week, is you almost can't take enough off. I, I'm not sure I've ever over pruned a tree. So don't be afraid. Start on your neighbor's trees. Volunteer to prune your, your, your city next door. Uh, prune their trees and, uh, you know, learn from them. No, but seriously, um, it's, it's hard to take too much uh, off. When you're in droughty times, which I was asked to address here, you probably want to back off a little bit and, and calibrate yourself. But experiment. Watch what happens. You know, do some very aggressive pruning occasionally, uh, again, on your neighbor's tree. And watch what happens there, and and you're you're going to learn something. You can't learn pruning by reading a book or or watching a little seminar here. You, you've got to get out there and uh, and do it, and watch and watch. That's the most important thing. Watch, come back, see what happened. So now we have a lead that we didn't have before. We cut away everything that wasn't the leader using reduction cuts, one to two inches. Uh, there's a double reduction cut there on the upper right and one removal cut. Hard to see that on the lower left. All right, see why it's important to talk about size of cuts, type of cuts, and then number of cuts. It's the best way to quantify this. So we're, we've got, I think we're out of time, another minute or two. Um, so here's uh, the objective is to support data, remove all but one dominant stem. That's kind of the theme today. So we showed you that tree earlier, but here we'd be looking at making, there's after pruning, be looking at making three or four reduction cuts in the three to four inch diameter range. There isn't a person on the planet that would walk by that tree that would recognize that tree was pruned. And I think we'll wrap it up with this one because it's 10 minutes to the hour. And this is a Corcus rubra. Uh, let's see, Northern Red Oak, and there's Brian Kempf, colleague there. This tree is planted in California, kind of developing into a shrub form. So we're going to convert it to a tree. There's 11 pruning cuts on the tree. All of them are reduction cuts, two inches in diameter. There's the cuts. So there's the tree. There's the cuts. That's a picture of the 11 cuts on the ground, two, two and a half inches in diameter. There's the tree on the left one year later and then two years later and that's what we started with. So if you if you look hard in that center you can really see how much growth has taken place here and how this is slowed down because we took so much off it uh, back here at the first pruning. So we can change the structure of trees. It takes uh, longer time. You can see we're kind of going to bigger trees here as we go through this little seminar. But as we get to the larger trees, we'll have um, a longer period of time to wait. That's like working with kids, guys. I mean, if we work with our kids when they're, when they're very young, it's going to be a lot easier than if we wait till they're older to try to fix fix things that aren't right. So I thank you very, very much. I didn't want to go over your time. And uh, I guess we can answer some questions uh, now. I'm going to, uh, Bo, you can, uh, I'll let you sort of uh, manage the questions. Just in the meantime, while we're, uh, while we're asking and answering some questions, I'm going to launch a poll. So all, all your, all the viewers, you should, should see a poll that's been launched. If you don't mind, uh, take a few seconds and just answer the few questions that uh, we're asking there. Go ahead, Bo. Uh, thanks, Ed. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I think your your uh, 
Your reputation precedes you as I, I was looking here and I think we maxed out at 484. Wow. So um, fantastic talk. We have a lot of questions from the floor and we'll try to get through some sure. of these. Uh, the first one is uh, what research has been done on pruning trees during drought conditions? Yeah, <laughs> not much, not much. Uh, that's what that's what you guys are for. You're in a drought. We're not in a drought here in Florida. And we need to recruit more people that do this kind of work, right? I mean, if, if all we really have to rest on is is uh, basic biology. You know, if you, if you really want to read about this, um, if you've got my pruning book, I've got I've got some in there for sure. But I reference a 1984 or 86 paper by Bodie and Rayner, and they have a very al very good alternate hypothesis to the coded model. And we really don't even know how many trees respond to uh, to decay organisms through the coded model, where an injury is required as as part of that model. When when Shigo described it, uh, or whether Bodie and Rayner's model is more important, which is basically their model is, and and we never talk about this. I've never heard it discussed. Their model is that the organisms are always in the tree. And whether it happened at seed germination or a little twig broke off and the organisms got in, stayed dormant in the sap stream as, as spores. And then the drought provides the perfect ideal conditions inside the tree for those spores to germinate into mycelium and then decay, it decay marches forward. So really since then there's, I don't know anybody working on this, and it's uh, it's it's frustrating, and it's it's not something that's going to be answered quickly. I know this is a terrible example uh, answer to the question, but it's reality. I can't, I can't make make up uh, anything more than that. I'd say go go easy, make your cuts two to three inches in diameter. Try to avoid the until the rains return. Try to avoid the uh, the larger cuts where, where possible, especially on the trunk. Avoid those cuts. Thanks, Ed. Uh, another question here. Um, have you done any research on performing crown reduction pruning to mature spruce to reduce the whipping effect, which can cause them to fail? What are your thoughts on this practice? Yeah, I mean, there's on, on the, the single leader X current type trees like Douglas fir, spruces, um, those types of trees. The, the arborists uh, are, are, seem to have mixed reports. What I hear on this is, is some will go to a whirl uh, where there might be eight or 10 branches uh, of various sizes and reduce or remove some of those uh, and then uh, skip a whirl or two and do it again. Uh, again and, and some don't believe in that at all. And uh, it's 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 difficult. I don't have a good handle really on on surveying arborist to uh, and then who do you believe? I mean, honestly, I mean, without doing this research yourself, uh, and I don't know anybody that's really really done this. You look at the people that that you know Brian Kane, Jake Misbauer, myself, Tom Smiley. Um, you know, I've done some research, and then and then Frank Wren and 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 a couple of others have have done calculations. So those six seven people are are about it, and I don't know anybody that's asked that question in particular. And it's a good one. Wish I had a good answer for you. I'd probably go up and remove some, reduce some, if I was concerned about a very tall tree near a target. Okay, thanks, Ed. I'm just going to keep throwing these out there. Um, just a variety of topics. This one came from John Wayne, and I'm just going to, it's multiple questions, but I'm just going to ask the top one, which is, how do you justify further pruning a tree with a recent failure? I think that's with your talks with the tree with the large cavities oh, yeah. and the decay and some of those issues is, I think, the, sure. the root of this question. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, the, it's a great question. So you, you look at a large tree like that first one I showed you that we went through with Larry Costello uh, squatting at the bottom, 100-foot tree in a park, uh, lots of targets around. You go there on a Saturday and the park is really, really packed. So there's a four-foot diameter limb that came out of the tree 
what I've observed, and Bo, I'm sure you have too, in, in the hurricanes, uh, you know, 04, 05 in particular, that, that two-year period, is many of the trees that I saw failed have failed before. And, and so when a tree fails, it, it often fails again. That's an expression I've used, and, and I've, I've seen it over and over. So when I see a tree failed, I, it's probably got other conditions in it that make that tree somewhat prone to failure. And, and so that's, that's my rationale is, is I don't want the tree to preserve the tree. I don't want the tree and people, uh, I, I don't want that tree to fail again. I, the observations I and others have made in, uh, oh, the national parks, um, like in giant Sequoia national park, for example, or Kings Canyon up in the Sierra Nevadas, very droughty conditions, uh, where the tops of trees sometimes literally several feet, eight, ten feet in diameter have been broken out, feet in diameter, or branches four to six feet in diameter have broken. That, that's a big pruning dose. And those trees sprout back and keep kicking. When Hurricane Wilma came through Miami, for example, uh, it took off the tops of most trees in the county. And you, we can't cut down all the trees in the county. And I was just in Miami last week, Thursday, Friday, and uh, there are plenty of trees there, and they're doing just fine. So I think we underestimate the tree's capacity to, um, to bring itself back and, and to grow from the latent buds. Thanks, Ed. Uh, this is kind of, I think, a similar question, and, it's, and I think it has to do with your comment really you can't over prune a tree and it, and it has to do with um, what about a lot of sucker growth from removing a lot of material uh, the, the this is came from Josh and he says that he's in Colorado with locust ashes and maples okay yeah well I think we've been we've been a little bit sold down the road on on sprouting um, so a general comment of sprouting sprouts are our friends all right so let me back up right because that might that probably surprises some people what I mean by that is that what caused the sprouting is not good, okay? A drought, cutting roots, um, uh, the, the tree breaking from, from a storm, the tree being topped, uh, most of the, the buds or, or foliage taken off. So the action wasn't terribly helpful, but the sprouts themselves, that's our future crown. And so we start a structure. Once the tree recovers over a period of years, typically, let it grow, let it, let it regain some uh, stored uh, energy in the rays and other parenchymas over a period of two, three, four years after a lightning strike or a drought. Let that tree recover and then start working the sprouts back to a, a reasonable structure. Uh, I removed the sprout management um, slides from the seminar today we just didn't have time to cover that but basically you approach it the same way at every break that you you pick one to be your lead and then you suppress or remove the others combination of suppression and removing the others so again a recap it's it's the action that's not good but the actual sprouts themselves uh, can be managed now when a tree is lion's tailed and you get all these interior sprouts, you know, those are your friends. Those are the guys and, that you're going to prune into the, the future tree, and you may eventually reduce those, those wide-spreading laterals if they get too long as your interior crown regenerates. So good, good question, absolutely. And just another one here is, uh, says, I have always used the one-third rule as a maximum removal amount under normal conditions, is this still appropriate or would a larger amount be real? All right, so when, when, when I gave a presentation about pruning and planting in, in Oregon at J. Frank Schmidt several years ago, I'll, I'll never forget what Keith Warren uh, said to me after uh, we were done. And he was uh, recently retired, but he was the plant breeder. Many of you know Keith, um, probably for 35 years there. At, uh, he's developed a lot of cultivars that we all grow throughout the U.S. anyway. And he, he thanked me for addressing pruning at planting because he said, we prune about a million and a half trees a year at all at planting. And I said, well, how much are you taking them off? And he said, we take off what's needed. And I thought that was really well said. 
And the, the, the approach we've taken out in landscapes and in probably 200 of these workshops we've done all around the world is when in doubt, re, take it out. When, when in doubt, don't be afraid to remove and learn and watch what happens. I have never stressed, to my knowledge, stress. I've never killed the tree pruning it. And I've been invited back to a lot of places, and we've been aggressive in most places when when it's needed. Not 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 all the time, but but when it's needed. Uh, and I think in general, you can t you take more, you take 30, 40 percent, maybe more on young trees, and on bigger trees like the big oak with Larry Costello at the base, uh, I would take uh, four four to five inch reduction cuts off of that tree in a heartbeat because uh, people are the most important part. Trees are, trees are cool, but people are the most part. They're the most important part. So that's, that's what we're trying to uh, – you always got to remember your objectives. Bo, Bo, I want to jump in real quick and make sure people know some folks are starting to leave. We can continue to a answer questions. But, Megan, you want to say a few words about how people can uh, find the recording of, of this before they leave? Yep. Um. <laughs> I will put the link um, to our YouTube page up in just now um, when I sign off. And so folks can save that and we'll have the video uploaded by tomorrow. So feel free to share the YouTube link far and wide. And um, I certainly appreciate folks for t tuning in today. And, and we'll stay around as long as Dr. Gillen wants to keep answering questions. So thanks again. Thanks, Megan. Um, Ed, if you... If Oh, I think we did we lose. But Dave Leonard's got a question up there. I see. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Well, Dave mentions that that the amount of pruning should be should be governed by the vigor of the tree, the vigor or vitality. I'm not sure what word we use these days, but you tell me uh, of the tree that we're that we're in front of. Absolutely. Yeah. With, without a doubt, there's there, there's a reason why this book is. 476 pages <laughs> can't cover it all in 30 minutes but yeah the um, a, a tree that's under drought stress a tree whose root systems have been cut a tree that's uh, under armillary attack ganoderma infected would be among the last trees you would prune live branches from I, I completely agree yeah dead branches go at it um, I, I, you know, a lot of arborists would agree to that there, there's even a community of arborists that, that are, are not so sure dead branches need to be removed. Uh, but yeah, vigor is definitely part of it. Be, be gentle on those that are less vigorous. There's a couple questions that came through related to time of year to prune and if there's a bad time of year to prune. Is there anything new on that or? Okay, probably the, the most recent research done has been done by Dirk D. Zifkin in Germany. And in central Germany and his climate, I absolutely agree that with his data. I mean, how, how, can, you, how can you say otherwise? I'm just not so sure that the fungus environment and the organisms there and, and the species there would relate to other parts of the world, especially drier climates. Uh, especially tropical climates, you know, it's just so different. We have so few people working on this. Uh, I mean, Matt can make something up, but I, I tend not to do that uh, generally. Um, it's, uh, I, I look at it more as uh, times of the year that perhaps are less favorable. Like, for example, when new leaves are coming out and shoots are expanding. So during that period of time, Trees are at a low energy status, but I think more importantly, it's a lot easier to damage the bark around the pruning cuts because the sap is flowing and it's easy to, to, to tear the bark. And not that that's the end of the world to tear the bark around the pruning cut because certainly we've all done it, but it's best not to. And it's just really easy to do it during that four to six week period. But having said that, I don't know any arboriculture firms that hang up their pruning saws for six, for four to six weeks a year. You know how do you how do you do that and run a business? You you can't do it. So I I think the we don't know really a lot about it honestly, except for some diseases in some places of the world. So um, you know, and then there's special cases obviously where like in Texas and up through the middle part of the North America up to Minnesota where where uh, oak wilt. Uh, is, is prevalent and trees are after, after pruning cuts, they're painted 
you know, and time of year is important with certain diseases. And there's other diseases. I'm just using that as an example. Um, but in, in, in general, it's during that growth flush that's, that's tougher. Hey, there's a question that came through earlier in our chat room that I just wanted to get your sense on. I thought it was interesting. And it was related to pruning standards. Early on, you mentioned some pruning standards. And it has to do with the German CTV standards that have been around since the 1980s compared to the 800 and whether arborists should be considering possibly these. Do you have an opinion or yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, if, if I've read them, it's been a long time, and I, and I apologize for that. I'm okay. Not that familiar with them. Sure. Um, let's see here. Let me scroll through, and I think you have – how many more questions you want to you wanna tackle? Oh, uh, I'm, I'm good. As, you know, there's still 342 people on, so. Uh, let me scroll down here. If you see Cindy in here, Ed, jump in as I look through our list. Oh, I, I, I had had one. Someone asked. Uh, now they said in university in University Park community of Dallas, Texas, I saw crepe myrtles that had been cultivated on a central leader. I was impressed and wondered when this cultivation would need to start. I'm sorry. I got I got um, reading some questions, <laughs> and I wasn't listening. Say that again. Okay. It's uh, he says in in University Park community of Dallas, Texas. I saw crepe myrtles that had been cultivated on a central leader. He says I was impressed and wondered when this cultivation would need to start. Pruning uh, crepe myrtles to a central leader. Yeah, pretty specific question. Um, Europeans. I apologize for a minute here while I answer that, um, but that. When I've attempted to prune crepe myrtles to a central leader probably 15 years ago, it was successful on certain cultivars like, for example, Natchez with the cinnamon bark, the, 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 the cross. That was – that with the white flowers. That was fairly easy, but there's an, I can't remember which cultivars were, were tougher, and I was trying pretty – pretty hard there's not a list of which ones are easier than others but we started when those things were whips you know the size of size of my finger and we trained them with wire stakes up the up the trunk and tied them and and headed you know, probably pruned two or three times a year as I remember and then we still got the trees and then we started pollarding them pollarding is a wonderful technique to keep trees the same size forever we don't use enough of that we have a lot to Europeans out there, we got a lot to learn from you guys about uh, polarding. You know, just as a culture, we don't seem to accept that technique, and it's actually the word is misunderstood here. Most arborists, I ask what polarding is, and and they'll confuse it with topping. It's it's uh, we still got a ways to go there, but yeah, you got to start early, early first year or two. And here's another question that came through. It says, uh, many species do not form dominant uh, dominant leaders even when trained to do so. So should you still try and do it, you know? Well, it's up to the individual. I mean, it's um, if you're working in, a, in a, an environment where either you don't have the resources, the customer doesn't have the resources to, to put into creating a leader in a particular tree, and, and no one's interested in that, then there's, there's no rule or law that says you have to do that. It, but it, we do know that when the aspect ratio is small, in other words, when you have a fairly dominant leader, that the unions are stronger, that, that we know. So people choose, to, I mean, there's, a friend of mine has never changed the oil in his car, and it's four years old. I mean, you know, there's no requirement to say you have to do certain things in life. And some people choose to, to manage their trees in, 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 in that way, and, and others don't. And, and that's just life, you know. I had another question here. It says uh, that during your discussion, uh, during reduction printing in your PowerPoint, keep, uh, one of the uh, – Mike wanted to know how far – out would you go on larger cuts? How far out on larger cuts? I, you know, there's there's no calibration for how much should we remove from, let's say, a 14 inch branch, uh, and and you know, should it be a three inch cut or should it go back to a six inch cut? Um, there's just 
almost no research on that. I've seen Frank Grin do some calculations uh, based on physical properties, physics, and boy, that needs to be tested. Um, you know, there, there's, there's that out there, but I, I'd really like to see more done. John Goodfellow is doing some on that as well. Uh, be good to get John hooked up. Uh, well, he's already hooked up with uh, with Andreas in Germany, and so they're doing some interesting work. But we need more details on different species and and how much to take off of certain size limbs. Because right now, you know, Dave Leonard would do something different than Bo Broadbeck and and Ed Gilman, um, and that's just the way it goes right now. We're, I don't think we're sophisticated enough to really know how to answer that question. So. The way I look at it, I look at that limb, that 14-inch limb that's 45, 50 feet long on that corcus, and I know if I make a three-inch cut, the tree is likely better off than if I do nothing. And and I know if I make an eight-inch cut, I'm going to probably get, uh, that's going to be cut through the heartwood, and so I'm more likely to, to get decay. And so somewhere in the middle there is probably the answer. So until we have more mechanical answers you know i approach it from a biological standpoint and if you what that means is if you're making two to three maybe even four inch cuts occasionally you're most of the time you're cutting into sapwood only and from a biological standpoint that's that's probably better than cutting into heartwood and making a big eight inch cut okay uh, another question here, it says, says, a colleague mentioned that in Moab, the hot desert sun is so intense that it's actually better not to prune fruit trees so that the shade from branches can better protect the sun from sun scarring. What are your thoughts on sun scarring? Uh, move from Moab. I, I, <laughs> I, have seen, I, I have seen sun scald on trees that I have pruned. So I have over pruned a um, an oak in Central Valley, California. It's in the same state. Moab is in uh, California, right? I think it is. No, Utah, Southern well, Utah. Utah. Okay, right, right, right. <laughs> Thanks for chiming in there, Megan. Um, and I've we're another one. And then in Sacramento, we uh, we 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 took too much out of the top of a uh, Celtus of, of a hackberry, Chinese hackberry and came back the next year to do a seminar the next year and saw sun scald on the top. So, you know, I would be lying to you if I told you that every tree I prune, every single tree I prune, I've done a perfect job on. So this, this is how I've learned. This is how we all learn is go out there, try stuff. You're going to make some mistakes. Uh, that's just called learning. I, I gave my, my kids a long leash to, to learn stuff and they've moved out of my house and they're not moving back. So, this is a good thing. I've been successful. So you got to do the same thing with trees. You got to teach yourself how to prune trees and how much you can take off. But preventing the top from sun scolding is a fantastic idea. So you do have to you do have to keep uh, keep that in the back of your mind for sure. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what this. I'm not sure. Maybe you can under, on this question. It says any research about pruning trees if the bark is slipping, and he put that in quotations. Is that Slipping. Hmm. I'm not sure oh, if that's maybe, some viral maybe, disease. Maybe that's doing during the, the the spring growth flush. I think I've heard people talk. You know, the bark is easy to slip off the wood, maybe. Uh, and it's just to be very careful during that time. And that's the time when the energy in the tree is lowest. You know, Shigo described that. Uh, Kim Coders reiterated that. But you know, having said that, uh, I've pruned trees at the absolute wrong time of year during the spring growth flush and <laughs> they did just fine now these are live oaks and so maybe live oaks in our area it doesn't matter i've tried to do bad things to trees timing wise and prune during this spring slippage or growth flush period and on live oaks anyway i, I can't i can't see it as as a negative so um i've got an open mind about pretty much everything with regards to pruning <laughs> And uh, I like to try things, and like I say, I have burned the tops of some trees that I've taken too much out of in California. I've never seen it in Florida. It probably can happen on thin bark trees. There was one question I'm trying to find it, and it because it's something that we see here on the Gulf Coast of the United States related to storms, and it had to do with dampening, storm dampening, pruning. 
and I'll just go ahead and paraphrase it from what I remember. Um, how large of a trees can you do the reduction pruning to try to reduce that? I mean, the, their videos were relatively smaller trees. Can you, can, will that translate to large mature trees if you're trying to do some reduction for storm purposes? Yes, uh, will but will will the the uh, tree react in exactly the same way that our six inch caliper live oaks did and and what uh brian kane and tom's you know several inch diameter maples and and other species did you know probably not because the the big mature trees got heart heartwood dead wood in the center of uh, many of the branches in some cases and so dry wood that's dead is going to be stiffer and doesn't bend as much so the dynamics will be different but we don't know how different so all we can really do is at this point is is know where to take it from the tree which is the crown periphery and then use biology as our guide two to four inch cuts because bigger ones are going to cut into heartwood uh, as, as our guide and and if you can't make a six inch cut then you maybe you can make three three inch cuts and take off the same amount from that same side of the tree so that's that's an approach you know it's more work you have to reposition yourself perhaps more often as as a climber but um, it's probably better for the tree, less efficient for the company, but better for the tree. And Ed, I saw somebody asked a question if this PowerPoint was going to be available on your web page. Yeah, I'm going to put about 60 PowerPoints. Um, I am retiring from academics in a few weeks from now. I'm not retiring from arboriculture. And I'm going to put uh, all 57 of my PowerPoints from uh, my course that I've been teaching for a couple couple of years now online, arboriculture. And so those will be up there, and they contain – yeah, probably all that stuff. Plus, plus, plus the. Um, where do you think I got those slides from? Got them from this. That's where I got them from. The book right there. So that's where a lot of them came from. But of course, you know, I've added stuff over the years too to them uh, since I wrote that. But yeah, they'll be up there. I've got about twenty up there now, but uh, they're not. They're not the exact one I just showed here. So they'll be up there soon, free for you guys to use. Um, do you all have any other questions coming in from the floor? I know there's, I can, we can keep going with this. Um, let me see here. There was one here related to reduction pruning and ice. All right. And well, you, you know, speak the, to that a little bit? yeah, the, I mean, the three basic forces we're dealing with, right? There's no direct research on ice. Jake Misbauer at the Morton Arboretum is working, working on that, uh, Last winter didn't cooperate, but the winter before, he about froze his fingers off applying ice on the cold winter days in Chicago. I don't think they have enough to really publish uh, yet, but the three forces are ice, snow, and wind on, on crowns. And the, the observations that, that, that I've made uh, is, is the upright branches in an ice storm and, and snowstorm and in some sense, many windstorms, it's the upright branches that, that break and the horizontal branches tend to be uh, on the tree with the uprights broken. So whether it was this Montreal storm we had back, I can't remember the years, 98 or something like that, or the, the uh, you know, there's other ice storms up, up there that's happened. I, I was up looking at many of those trees after several. I used to live in the Carolinas when ice storms came through, and I've seen a lot of ice damage, and it's the uprights that go. And you have four to eight-inch diameter breaks. Um, the guys at the, you know, Kevin Smith and those guys at the Northeast Experiment Station have, have done some real nice work cataloging the size of the breaks. And it's the, the horizontal branches uh, for two reasons. One, they, they tend to have more reaction wood. In, in those species that form reaction wood, which are about half the species we work with, the other half don't. And the actual orientation of the wood, you know, the wood orientated this way and loaded with ice is stronger than wood orientated this way and, and loaded with ice. So those are a few comments. I have a personal, uh, I have a personal question growing up in southeastern North Carolina, it's big blueberry. 
country there, I'm wondering about pruning of blueberry bushes and plants and specifically just sort of letting them go, go nuts, you know, and just, and the fruit production you get from that versus something like you were talking about having some kind of central um, branch or central base there. Um, and, yeah, and I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, Mark. Yeah. You know, I <laughs> eat blueberries, but I've never <laughs> grown them. You know, I, I know that back in the late 60s, early 70s, most of the apple orchards in the United States, in North America, actually all up into Canada as well, went to this central leader mm -hmm. format uh, or structure. And if you go through the uh, the hills of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia now, and, and look at some of the apple orchards, any of the apple orchards, actually, if it's not a brand new one, yeah, and and it's been around for two or three decades. It's going to have a central leader with small aspect ratio branches, and it, it's because they figured out by experience mostly that when the branches are loaded with apples, it's the bigger branches that ended up breaking. If you can prune them to a central leader and keep the branches small, keep that aspect ratio small, the structure is better. Now, now they've gone through it to a different system completely. They're grown on trellises in a two-dimensional format, kind of like a, a spalier, if you will. Um, but but you'll still see lots of central leader apple orchards around. But blueberries, I don't know. I, it's a bush, you know, not a tree. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, I was going to say you, they, they apply the same thing to uh, muscadine grapes too, and that's you know that that seems to work. But and they tie them up. Yeah, it's yeah. different. Yeah. yeah. And I think we can maybe wrap it up with one more right, question. Yeah, sure. And it has to do with your structural pruning. Should you do it as soon as you uh, get a tree in from the nursery or should you wait for the tree to become established? Absolutely do it at planting without question. Um, we, If you look in the, I don't know, two or three years ago, Journal of Arboriculture, we have a pruning at planting study that we did and we cited the other one done in Sweden in 2010. So two pretty good good studies that show pruning and planting gives you a very small, if, uh, if, if any, reduction in growth. Uh, and yet at the end of the two or three year period after, after you plant the tree, uh, the structure is of course much better. And that, that better structure is, is there for good and you, you've sacrificed a few millimeters in diameter growth of the trunk. So start it at planting yeah, I do that when I plant trees in my yard. I, I take care of the problem. Good nurseries always do that at planting. If they're developing central leader type shade tree species, they're pruning at planting, absolutely, to, to get that leader without question. Great question. Start it early. Again, if you're in doubt, start in your neighbor's tree. Volunteer the next community over. Say, hey, we'll bring our crews over. We'll prune your trees and planting. No, but seriously, you'll learn. Take a street and, and do a street that way and see what happens. Just watch what happens. Well, Ed, thank you very much. It's it was always fun. interesting uh, listening to you. There's always something new. You know, this, this is your last comment. I know for years it was let the tree become established, and so I really appreciate you doing this. Um, I want to thank, again, the Utah State University Forestry Extension for hosting the Tree Fund, as well as Tree Fund's crown partners, Bartlett Tree Experts and Davy Tree. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Ed. And um, for all of you out there, please uh, take a look at treefund.org. There's grants available. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, consider supporting uh, one of their initiatives out there. And uh, it supports research like yours, Dr. Gilman, that has been done over the years. Thanks all for coming, guys. Thanks, Appreciate everybody. It. Thank Have you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mark.